Lord Jesus, who confounded your enemies by covering in glory and splendour your body that had been most insulted and despised, grant us the grace to lead in your likeness a new, divine and immortal life. Grant us, O Lord, to realise in us the priceless gift of redemption, to grow more and more every day from virtue to virtue, until we come to you, O God, who are the source and the true life. Come, divine Saviour, into our hearts, as in the upper room. Repeat in us, as you did to the apostles. With your heavenly greeting, peace be with you. Show us, as in St. Thomas, your glorious wounds, and stay with us for ever. Amen. Let us pray. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, Son of the living God, God Most High, who has created me and formed my soul after your own divine image and likeness, and had made me capable of everlasting happiness. Grant that I may serve you, my Lord, my God and my Father, with a faithful heart, that I may fight against my sins with a holy hatred, and that all sinful passion and affection being destroyed within me, I may be renewed in perfect innocence of life. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who has given me for my use the heaven, the earth, the sea and all the things that are in them, and has granted them for my service and comfort. Permit, I beseech you, O Lord, that I may never abuse your creatures, but that all the works of your hands may tell of your goodness and may lead me to admire, to know and to love you. Praise and honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, out of your affection for me, granted me to be born in the true Christian faith, and has mercifully brought me up from the beginning of my life, supplying me with food and the other necessaries for the nourishment and support of my body. May my heart find no relish except in and through you. May you alone possess my innermost soul. May I exceedingly hunger for you, the bread of heaven, and thirst for you, the fountain of life, so that this life's exile ended, I may deserve to be satisfied with the joys of your eternal perfection. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who up until this time has preserved and delivered me from countless dangers of soul and body, even when I abused your gifts, not deserting me. Illuminate my heart, I beseech you, with the brightness of your grace, that truly perceiving your goodness to me and my own ingratitude toward you, I may bemoan myself, I may be hateful in my own sight, but I may please you, my Creator and my only Redeemer, in all things. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I lie immersed in the most loathsome vices and was leading a most ungodly life, in your long-suffering bore with me for such a long time and brought me to repentance. Grant that my acceptable contrition and holy works I may expiate the stains of my past sin and that from now on I may lead a life of purity and love you above all things with most burning love. Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who, when I was on the brink of the very precipice and just within the jaws of hell, did not permit me to perish but called me, though deaf, and trying to run from you to the way of salvation. Grant that from now on I may follow after you with humble devotion and with a joyful heart correspond to your holy inspirations with from my heart farewell to all things and may cleave inseparably to you alone. 
Praise, honour and glory be to you, O Christ, who always directed me, the vilest of sinners, has protected me, has looked upon me with the eyes of mercy, and still so fondly supports and cherishes me with your goodness, despite my daily transgressions, as if forgetful of all others. You cared for me alone. Grant that I also may love you most ardently, leaving all transitory things for your sake, and may think of you alone, and may with a ready mind and in all places follow and perform your holy will. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall sing your praise.
A reading from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 12. Meanwhile, when a multitude of many thousands had gathered together, so much so that they trampled on each other, he began to tell his disciples, first of all, Beware the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. But there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in darkness will be heard in the light. What you have spoken in the ear, in the inner room, will be proclaimed from the housetop. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that they have nothing more that they can do. But I warn you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Aren't five sparrows sold for two coins? Not one of them is forgotten by God. But the very hairs of your head are all counted. Therefore do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. I tell you, everyone who confesses me before men, him will the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me in the presence of men will be denied in the presence of the angels of God. Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But those who blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious how or what you will answer or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that same hour what you must say. One of the multitude said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? He said to them, Beware, keep yourselves from covetousness, for a man's life does not consist of the abundance of the things which he possesses. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man produced abundance. He reasoned within himself, saying, What will I do, because I don't have room to store my crops? This is what I will do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my God, my goods. I will tell my soul, Soul, you have goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You foolish one, for tonight your soul is required of you. The things which you have prepared, whose will they be? So is he who lays up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious for your life, what you will eat, nor yet for your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they don't sow, they don't reap. They have no warehouse or barn, and God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? Which of you, by being anxious, can add a cubic, cubit to its height? If, then, you aren't able to do the very least of these things, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, and how they grow, they don't toil, neither do they spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them. If this is how God clothes the grass in the field, which exists today and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Don't seek what you will eat or what you will drink, and do not be anxious. For the nations of the world seek after all these things. But your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the, God, the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell that which you have, and give gifts to the needy. Make for yourselves purses which don't grow old a treasure in the heavens that doesn't fail, where no thief approaches, neither moth destroys. For well where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. Let your waist be dressed, and your lamps burning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
For many of us it is easy for us to be a Christian, but for some others it could be very different. There are an increasing number of countries where it is illegal to be a Christian, illegal to go to church and illegal to be in, the possession, in possession of any Christian book or other material. Not only can it be illegal, but the punishment can be severe. There are several places where you can expect execution, but many more where indefinite prison terms are the norm. There are any number of cases right now where Christian priests and members of churches have spent 10 or more years in prison, not, uh, not allowed contact from friends or family, and without any pretense of trial. I personally know people who are followed home from church on a Sunday by the police in an act of intimidation, despite the fact that they live in a country which claims to be tolerant of all religions. If these people can endure these things for Christ, surely we can put up with the occasional sarcastic comment or ridicule. After all, what is a short span of endurance in this world compared with an eternity in the next? Better, by far, to be true to our Lord in this world than to be denied access to paradise forever. Most surely, the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, the one who blasphemes against Christ's Church, who maliciously opposes or persecutes it, can never find forgiveness. The reason for this is quite simple. If we make up the Church our enemy, if we turn our back to the love that Jesus wants to give us, how can we possibly ever find forgiveness in God's grace? It is simply not possible. However, that is not to say that we cannot reverse the process and make a change. Consider St. Paul. Once there was a time when he blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. He frustrated the Spirit's working. He persecuted the Church with all his vigour. But Christ revealed himself to him, and he made a life-saving change. So it is that we hear that captives pray for their tormentors, and from time to time the tormentors give up their lives to become tormented. Jesus left us with a wonderful promise. If and when we are called upon to stand up for him, the Holy Spirit will reveal to us exactly what we should say, as happened to Stephen when he faced trial. The man in the crowd in today's reading had a grievance with his brother, over an inheritance, and how true it is that inheritances cause so much hostility. Either the brother had seized the part of the estate due to this man for himself, or, as is more likely suggested by the Greek, the man wanted more than the portion that had fallen to him. To set this in context, an elder brother automatically inherited a double portion as in the Law of Moses in Deuteronomy 21, 16 and 17. And it is likely that the younger wanted Jesus to intervene and rule that the brothers should inherit equally. To support this contention, Jesus remarked that the man should be aware of greed or wanting more, as the Greek translation would have it. And it is the man's natural tendency to this that is so often his undoing. To make his point, Jesus provided a parable which reveals that he, we can become so wrapped up in our wealth and our business affairs that we forget that the things we have to do and the things that we have are not of our own, but are merely on temporary loan from God. In truth, we need to remember a couple of important things in our lives to make sure we do not stray too far down this path. First of all, that the earth belongs to the Lord, and all that is in it, it does not belong to us. We are here to look after the earth for God, as trustees, for him and for our descendants. This might come as a bit of a shock to some, 
But we only have what the Lord chooses to allow us, and what he gives us he can and often does take away. Secondly, that our time on earth is limited, and it is something that we can and all be agreed upon. For every single one of us accepts that one day we will die, and that our time here will be brought to an end. The ancients used to believe that in the afterlife we had a use for our wealth, and so kings and princes were buried with their treasure. Today, though, we tend not to believe this, and we leave our possessions to our children. The Bible teaches us quite clearly that worldly possessions are of no use to us in the next life, and that the accumulation of wealth over and above our proper needs serves no purpose at all. In the passage, Jesus makes the point as strongly as he can that only spiritual wealth counts for anything. The only concern we should have is the well-being of our soul, for the bank cannot transfer money to heaven.
Let us pray. Almighty God, who has given your only Son to be to us, both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life, grant us grace that we may always most thankfully receive his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavour ourselves to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.